So my name is Sasha, and I'm going to talk to you about paradigm shifts in the world of mental health and mental illness, and the way my friends and I are changing the world. But first, a beautiful metaphor. How many people here have ever grown a garden? Raise your hand. Not bad for Manhattan. <laughs> so real quick. If you've ever grown a garden or if you've never grown a garden, one of the first things you need to know when you're growing a garden is what kind of soil you have. You need to have, you need to have organic matter at the top. And um, you can basically break soil down into the topsoil and the subsoil. And then the subsoil is based on whatever the bedrock is below. So the topsoil is where the organic matter is, and the subsoil is where the micronutrients are. And most plants stay in the topsoil. If you're growing a garden of vegetables and flowers, it's like the, your, your stuff is growing up there. But then there's certain plants, there's certain plants like the humble dandelion that have deep tap roots. And what they do is they go down into the subsoil, pull up nutrients from the subsoil, and then when they die, they break down into the topsoil. So there's this whole relationship between the above and the below. I think this is a really great metaphor for talking about culture. There's a lot of really important things that happen in, in the cultural underground. And there's a lot of things that happen in the mainstream. And the reason that they're happening is because there's, you know, there's these things that, there's this whole relationship. We will come back to this. I'm going to tell you a story. And it's a really personal story. When I was 18 years old, I was locked up in a psychiatric ward for the first time in my life. The police found me walking on the subway tracks, and I thought that the world was about to end and that I was being broadcast live on primetime television on all the channels. I thought that there was microscopic transmitters implanted under my skin that was recording my thoughts for some top-secret branch of the CIA, and I hadn't slept in a really long time. The cops found me, wrestled me to the ground, brought me to an underground jail cell. Then I ended up in Bellevue Psychiatric Emergency Room, and then I ended up in a public mental hospital upstate for two and a half months, and then a private mental hospital, like a behavior modification place that my mom put me in. The, the story that I'm telling you is this one that I have carried around for years. It's like the story that, that like had an enormous impact on me as a teenager. Try and imagine it. Try and imagine being an 18-year-old kid and you're suddenly told that you have a biological brain disease that you're going to have for the rest of your life. and that you, There's nothing that you can do that, that except to take the medication they're telling you you need to take and that you know, you're probably going to be on disability. You're not really going to be able to travel. You know, it's like... like I really wanted to understand what, what had happened to me. And so I, I stepped out and I looked, at, I looked into the history a little bit. This is a picture of me and my classmates in 1980. You can see me, I'm, like the, um, I'm on the right side, a little pipsqueak right there. <laughs> um, 1980 is a very important year if we want to understand the way that all of us think about mental health and mental illness. 1980, this happened to be the year that the, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders was published. <laughs> the DSM-3 was put out by a, a small group of psychiatrists. who they, they, had a, they had a very clear idea and a very narrow idea of their idea of what mental health and mental illness was. And it was called the Biopsychiatric Model. At the heart of the Biopsychiatric Model is the idea that the most important way we're going to understand what's wrong with us has to do with our biology, has to do with the chemicals in our brain. And so that's the language that we end up using. It's a set of metaphors that we end up using to talk about ourselves. The thing about the DSM was that they said at the time it was, you know, it was neutral and it was scientific. It was, they created it, you know, and they were like, well, this doesn't, this isn't actually, you know, we're just describing what's happening. But often when people are describing things, they describe it from their own point of view. There's so many different ways to think about the human experience. When I was a teenager, when I had that first breakdown in reality, reality, when I ended up locked up in the psych ward, I was a college student, you know? And I was, like a lot of the people in this room, I had a lot of pressure on me to go to school. I had a lot of pressure on me to be something really special. In fact, 
you know, as an elementary school student here, I remember the Friday assemblies where they would stand up here and they would tell us this, every Friday that we were going to be the next presidents and businessmen of the future. <laughs> How many people know the, um, the allegory of, of, like, the platonic allegory of the cave? Remember this from school? In a lot of ways, if you want to understand what I was experiencing as an 18-year-old, it's a, it's, a, it's a great way to do it. Plato's allegory of the cave is, is basically, there's a bunch of people in a cave, and they're staring at a wall, looking at shadows, and then one person breaks free, goes outside the cave, and realizes that he spent his entire life looking at shadows of the real, but that there's a real world outside. And that was the experience that I had at 18 years old. I had this experience of like, my mind opening up and expanding in all these different ways. And then I woke up in the quiet room of, you know, the Bloomingdale like, Psychiatric Hospital in White Plains. And I was doped up on a drug called Haldol and I was drooling on myself. And they were telling me that I had a biological brain disease. If we want to understand the way we think about mental illness, we have to understand the political and historical context of it. 1980, that same year the DSM came out, was the same year that Ronald Reagan was elected president. And, you know, it was the same period of time that they cut the social safety next. There was this enormous transfer of wealth from the public to the private. It was the rise of multinational corporations and corporate power. And it was the, it was the triumph of consumer culture. You know, most of us lived through it. You know, it had a big impact. You can talk about biological brain diseases, but at the same time, it's good to understand like, what was happening with the pharmaceutical industry at the time. That same period of time with, that the DSM was rising and neoliberal economics were wreaking havoc on this country, there was a whole way of thinking about our brains that was shifting. You know, there was the pharmaceutical industry started making money. In earlier times, they were making money off of, off of drugs that would cure diseases. And then what, you know, they started, they started creating the drugs that basically would keep us being able to function all right, whether they're arthritis drugs or asthma drugs or anxiety drugs or sadness drugs or shyness drugs. You know, to the point at which you know, there so many people were taking drugs that it was kind of like, you know, we were like, <laughs> what, what road do you want to take? They all lead to the same place, <laughs> you know? We lived through it, you know? We lived through, we lived through the changes, and we're, we're still in it. Okay, so I have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to do the best I can to, to impart as much information as I can to you. When I was 27 years old, I wrote an article in the San Francisco Bay Guardian called The Bipolar World. And basically what I was saying in the article was, look, I've had all these experiences, I'm diagnosed with this thing called bipolar disorder, I take the medications and they seem to help me, but I don't trust the pharmaceutical industry at all, and I want to understand what's going on out in the world, and I'm looking for other people like me. And, you know, I learned this great thing, which is that when you put yourself out there, when you actually are brave or crazy enough to like, get up in front of a bunch of strangers and tell some story about yourself, people feel compelled to tell you their story back. And so one of the people who wrote back to me was this incredible person named Jax McNamara. And Jax and I, the night we met, we were both folks you know, who were really creative, who'd both been diagnosed bipolar, both been locked up. And the night we met, we stayed up all night till the sun rose, and we, we wrote... <laughs> we decided to start this organization. We decided to start this website in this very kind of grandiose way that manic people sometimes have, <laughs> called the Icarus Project. Now, Icarus in Greek mythology is the boy who has wings, but he doesn't know how to use them. He ends up flying too close to the sun and drowning in the ocean. What if, what if instead of seeing ourselves as diseased or disordered, we saw ourselves as having dangerous gifts like having wings? What would that do to our sense of self? How would that change the nature of how we rolled in the world, as it were? So we made this website, and, and it was, you know, it was a website where we brought together all these people, and we created a bunch of forums. We had forums like, um, 
alternate dimensions or psychotic delusions. Talk about the experiences that you've had, you, you know, like, and then all of a sudden, people from all over the world were talking about these experiences that they had with other people who, who had had similar experiences. There was a form called Give Me Lithium or Give Me Meth, which was all about <laughs> people's relationship to illegal drug use and what, you know, like, and what's mental illness and what's addiction and how do we navigate those, you know, Th those worlds. And one of the things about the Icarus Project is that when we started it, we started it from this place of if you take psychiatric drugs or you don't take psychiatric drugs, you're welcome here. And if you use diagnostic categories like bipolar or anxiety to describe yourself, or you think all those categories are ridiculous and you have some other language, you're welcome here. This is a place for people to come together and share their stories and build community. Um, so a year after we put together, the year after the Icarus Project went online, we published this book called Navigating the Space Between Brilliance and Madness, A Reader and Roadmap of Bipolar Worlds. And the idea behind this book was basically we just wanted to give people an alternate set of roadmaps. We wanted to say, like, look, there's the mainstream ideas about what it means to be mentally ill and mentally well. We have some different ones. We're going to share them with you. you know? And so that's what we did. Um, we sold out of this book really quickly. Jax and I drove around the country in our pickup truck facilitating discussions with, with people all over the, the country, and the website continued to grow. I'm going to flip through here and just give you a sense of some of the art that came out of the Icarus Project like in, in the, the first bunch of years, because I think what I'm hoping you'll get a sense of is that we have this very alternate view than what you'll find in the mainstream. For example, this image right here is about suicide, but it doesn't have the traditional idea about what, like how to talk or not talk about suicide. It's saying, you know, often when people are suicidal, it's because they want their lives to be different. It's not just about brain chemistry. You know, the National Association for Suicide Prevention, they, they have these walks and they raise all this money, but where's that money going? It's going for research, and where's that research going? That's pharmaceutical drugs. You know, I mean, it's like, I'm not saying that all the drugs are bad. I'm just saying there's a lot of different ways to look at things. Here, I'll walk you through this one. So here's the, here's the story, you know. You're walking along in the city and you're freaking out. And what do I do? And you want to go to the meeting to, you know, find some other people like you. And you get to the meeting and it's for, the, you know, the National Association for the Eradication of Mental Illness, which for anyone who gets the joke, we're making fun of an organization called NAMI, because NAMI's mission statement was all about eradicating mental illness. Now, there's I know some amazing NAMI people in leadership positions, but fundamentally, if we're going to talk about changing the culture, we can't start from the place of being like, okay, well, mental illness, you know, the, mental illness exists as, in, in this way, and therefore we need to reduce the stigma around it. It's actually more useful to, to tease it apart and figure out what's this language we're using, and maybe there are other ways. So then she leaves there, and then she goes, and then she finds some other people at an Icarus Project meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I think the, you know, like, there's a lot of ways that you can look. We have so much pressure on us to be normal, you know? There, there's like, there, there's so few outlets for, like, you don't, you, you don't want to get up in front of a room full of people and tell them you're crazy, you're, you know? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> but sometimes you just have to be real about it. It's like sometimes I feel like, you know, there's four of me, <laughs> you know? <laughs> That's how it is. Um, <laughs> the, um, one of the things I'm the most proud of with the Icarus Project is that we've really, we've really tried to create a culture of health and wellness and tried to reach out to a whole lot of people who often are not thinking about health and wellness. You know, artistic, creative, young people, for the most part, are thinking about other stuff, you know? Um, and sometimes it really just comes down to basics. You know, really so much of what mental health is, it's not just about taking the medication. It's like about how are you eating? How are you sleeping? What kind of exercise are you doing? What kind of routine do you have, you know? And drugs, if you gotta take your drugs, you take your drugs. Um, there's lots of different kinds of drugs. So, um, so you might notice that you know we started the Icarus slides with talking about talking about 
the lone Icarus figure. And at some point, we really changed the image to like a group of people gathering together. We put out this um, booklet, Friends Make the Best Medicine, a guide to creating community mental health support um, a bunch of years ago now. And people all over the world download this thing off the front of our website and then use it to start local Icarus Project groups. And it has a whole lot of alternative visions that you're just not going to find in the mainstream. It has, you know, meeting agreements for if you're going to get together. What, it's, it's, it's hard to get together and talk about this stuff. The Harm Reduction Guide to Coming Off of Psychiatric Drugs is definitely our most popular and most controversial publication. And but basically, we put it out because there's so much information about going on to psychiatric drugs and so little information about coming off. I don't know how many people in this room have been on psychiatric meds, but the stats are a bunch of you have, and you, you know, if you've tried to go off them, you know it's really hard. Um, so this is another guide that you can download directly off of our website. Right now, you can go there, click there, download. <laughs> we put this booklet out, um, we put this booklet out during the time of the Occupy movement because there were so many people that were burning out. So those of us who've been social justice activists and who've been in the streets for years on and off, we, there are these repeating patterns that happen. There's a lot of ways that the people who really want to change the world end up burning themselves out. And we're really interested in changing it. The heart, really, the message of the Icarus Project is you're not alone, you know? Which, in the society that we live in, it's so easy to feel like you're alone. We're living in times now, you know, it's 2013 as I speak these words. And, you know, one in five Americans are taking a psychiatric drug, according to the Wall Street Journal. You know? <laughs> one in five, one in five, you know, Americans. And there's, there's a, a whole world, if this is a new topic to you and you're interested, there is a world of interesting things happening right now in the world of mental health. But, but what I want to you to understand is that really, to go back to this metaphor from the beginning, Think of me as like a, an emissary from the cultural underground. I'm assuming most likely that you probably have not heard of a lot of things that I'm telling you right now. And there's a good reason for that. It's because it's not on television. And all of these things that I'm talking about are not in the mainstream media. But the way that change happens is it starts underground, and then there's ways that it ends up up in the mainstream. And right now, at this very moment, you are playing your part in helping to change the world because we're pulling these ideas down from below where, you know, they're, they're like been quietly sitting and bringing them up onto center stage. Thank you for playing your part in changing the world. <laughs>